Okay, so we're back, and we'll now take a look at our tasks for today. Device mobility and extension mobility, what they have in common and when to use each of them. Uh, we've already talked about the startup configs in previous modules, previous deep dive modules, so hopefully if you're uh, watching this as a class on demand later, or if you are going through the workbook and wanting to actually perform some of these tasks that you've gone through and done the startup configs, if you're renting rack time from us, or if you're using your own racks, not using our racks, then make sure you apply these router and CUCM startup configs both to your own lab before beginning. We provide all of that for you, including a CSV file for CUCM. Make sure you watch this video here on importing uh, configurations in CSV format for the CUCM so that you, uh, you know, there's a couple anomalies that you have to watch out for. Uh, LDAP we mentioned, actually we include static users on this uh, lab and we've gone back and done so retroactively for the last lab as well that's highly dependent rather than depending on LDAP which doesn't import properly. And uh, also, you know, a couple anomalies with <coughs> calling party transformation CSS but something that we explain in this uh, brief 15 minute video on this link. So make Let's take a look at our first assignment for device mobility, specifically for movement between sites and within a country, so within a device mobility group. So we're told to provision Jack's phone, his corporate headquarter phone one, to be able to pick up and move his physical IP phone to the branch one site. We're told to ensure that when he arrives and attaches his IP phone to the branch one subnet, that he takes on all of the characteristics of the branch one device pool labeled DP underscore branch one dash phones. And I should probably go ahead and note quickly that uh, we have basically copied every site's device pool and made uh, new original device pools for phones and gateways at each site. So there used to only be you know, device pool corporate headquarters, device pool branch one, and device pool branch two. Those three device pools for the three sites. Now there are two device pools per site for a total of six. One for gateways at each site and one for phones at each site. Just to avoid any overlap and also to allow for large scale design. And also what we've done is we've gone and uh, broken out our calling search spaces and partitions a little bit more. Actually, we've just created a new partition, one for each site, uh, basically for dialing only to that site, and uh, broken out our, deleted our emergency services patterns, so 911 and 9911, and then also 112 and 0112. And we've broken those out into site-specific. So corporate headquarter has 911 and 9911 as route patterns rather than translation. Branch 1 has 911 and 9911. And branch 2 has only 112 and 0112. And we've actually created new device pools, as I'm sorry, not device pools, but new uh, route groups as well that point only to the to the one gateway at each site. So before, when we had site-specific device pools, uh, sorry, I keep saying that, site-specific route groups, <clears throat> they would point to, at least primarily, with the distribution algorithm of top-down, they would point primarily to their home site gateway, but then they would also have backup gateways. And we did this with the top-down distribution algorithm so that we could only use standard local route group, only use one route pattern, but the problem is it works just fine for dialing emergency services if the primary gateway is up. But if it's not, then it allows failover, and that obviously doesn't work in real life. So we've broken those out, especially because we want to be absolutely sure that if we're dialing from a corporate headquarter site and device pool, then we actually dial 911 only out the corporate headquarter gateway. And if for some reason that gateway should be down, then 911 would fail, but we don't want it to go out a remote gateway. It's obviously not good if 911 or emergency services fail, but it's worse 
if we actually connect somewhere for emergency services, think that we're you know, about to receive help only to find out that they can't help us and we've just wasted more time where someone could be you know, having a coronary important that we'd obviously need to get a hold of medical professionals quickly. So we don't want to waste any time going out a backup gateway uh, and just be told that we can't actually get the call routed or have confusion. We'd rather that call fail and we get immediate audible response and we can make a call through our mobile or something else. Okay, so we've gone back and changed the design of CUCM in the startup configs to accommodate that so that our testing today will work properly. Okay, so we're also told, and this is what I was mentioning just a little bit ago before the break, that for the live and recorded deep dive classes, we'll use the exact same subnets, just like you saw in our logical topology, as the corporate headquarter and branch one sites have connected to them respectively and physically. The corporate headquarter will be 177.1.11.0 slash 24, and branch one will be 177.2.11.0 slash 24. For your self-study using this workbook, where you have remote, hopefully hardware IP phones connected via uh, Cisco Easy VPN, then we instruct you to temporarily discontinue the use of DHCP for your corporate headquarter phone one settings and manually configure the IP address, default router and TFTP address, using the following subnet. So assuming you are already using 192.168.10.0 slash 24, if not, then replace those first three octets with whatever you're using. But assuming that you are using 192.168.10, and a slash 24, we're going to use a more specific match. And if you're not that familiar with routing, think of it like a telephone number. CUCM matches DNs based on most specific match, right? Routing is the same thing. So if we have a slash 24 or 255.255.255.0, then that is less specific than a slash 32 or 255.255.255.255. This is what's known as a host IP address. And so if we use these in CUCM as subnets, they will be, in fact, subnets, but the essentially the network address, the broadcast address, and the host address, really there are no network and broadcast in a host address, but they are all one. So there is only one host address on that subnet, it definitively spe you know, specifies that dot .150 is a separate subnet or in the case that it's a host route, basically, or a host IP, a host subnet mask, that 160 is very separate and different from dot .150. So you'll use dot .150 for uh, your corporate headquarters subnet with all four 255s as your subnet mask and then 160 as your branch one subnet. And you guessed it, we'll use 170 later on for our branch two subnet, again, with all, all ones for bits or all four octets of the subnet mask are 255. Okay, and again, these self-study subnets will be represented in the downloadable solutions for CUCM for the deep dive module. Okay, and we'll create them as we go along. Ensure that while Jack's corporate Headquarter phone one is visiting the branch one site that all of the following work properly. Ensure that he retains his class of restriction and that all calls still show up as coming from 1001 and Jack Shepard. Ensure that Jack's phone reflects the proper date and time. Ensure that VOIP calls back to corporate headquarter phone two use the G729 codec and we'll show them using the 711 to begin with. Ensure that multicast music on hold streams properly to his phone over at branch one. We'll take a look at that. Ensure that if he attempts to set up a conference that the local branch one router hardware resources are utilized. All calls that he attempts to make should go out the branch one gateway primarily. Calls to 911 should only be allowed to go out the branch one gateway. And Jack's dialing habits should not be required to change in any way. So for example, if Jack currently dials nationally to reach a PSTN phone that happens to be at branch one, so the uh, geographic 
area code of 512. So like uh, he dials 9 for secondary dial tone, <clears throat> 1 for the country code or national long distance, 512-602-6222, he should still be able to do so. Ensure that if the Branch 1 site were to lose WAN connectivity, that his corporate headquarter phone 1 would fall back to the Branch 1 SRST router. If the Branch 1 site's location-based CAC were to report not enough bandwidth, that AAR would be invoked and function properly. Includes calls back to headquarter phone 2. And ensure that calls made into Jack's phone display uh, display in the same manner as they do every other phone at branch one site. So in other words, a call from a PSTN phone line one, which is local to the corporate headquarters site, where Jack's phone is when he's not roaming, it should display to Jack's phone now that he is roaming as 1-206-501-5111 versus just 206-501-5111 as it would when he was not roaming. However, a call from the PSTN phone line 2, which would have, when he was not roaming, displayed as 1-512, it should now just display as 512-602-6 triple 10 digits. Okay, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and go over to our CUCM server. Log in and begin to start our configuration. So first of all, let's take a look at our end users. Notice that we only have one user, E. Hawking, Eloise Hawking. Now, <clears throat> we were told to set it up for Jack Shepard's corporate headquarter phone one. Now, the reason we don't have a user is because we really don't need one for device mobility, and we'll be using her for extension mobility later. Let's take a look at our phones. Let's sort according to description. So here we've got corporate headquarter phone 1 and 2, and notice that they are on the 177.1.11.0 subnet. We've got branch 2 phone 1 and 2 on the 177.3.11 subnet, and then branch 1 phone 1 on the 177.2.11.0 slash 24 subnet. Okay, so corporate headquarter phone 1 is the one that we're interested in. What we need to do first is scroll down on the device page and turn on device mobility mode from default, which that's off in the service parameters. We need to turn it to on. And save this. Restart our phone. Before we do that, Let's actually bring that phone over. It'll probably restart on its own. Go ahead and begin a new. Phone over to, uh, let's see, 1002. And let's just go ahead and hit our speed dial here for Hugo Reyes. Bring our uh, friend Hurley over here. Go ahead and answer his call. Put it on. There we go. So we don't have feedback. And let's take a look at our stream setup. So once these refresh, we've got G711 between these two phones. Okay, so we've got G711 between the two phones when a call is made on net. I'm going to go ahead and hang that call up. Jack's currently, we're still using a single, or, or sorry, standard local route group. So if Jack makes a call, well actually let's go take a look at our uh, translation patterns. Right. 
route patterns that we created new emergency specific route patterns. So we've got our, let's actually do it according to partition and actually contains uh, BR1. Here we've got 911 and 9911 in a uh, branch one only PSTN partition. Likewise for branch two, we've got 112 and 0112. And then for, not branch three, but corporate headquarters, we've got a 911 and 9911 that only point there. And notice that this points to the route list of corporate headquarter only. The branch one patterns pointed to the branch one only route list and the branch two pointed to the branch two only route list. Let's go ahead and click on that and see that the only route group in there is branch two only for the branch two only route list. And let's go ahead and take a look at those new route groups as well. Here we see our, uh, what we did have was route group branch one, two, and headquarters. And now I've relabeled those as branch one, then HQ branch two backups, branch two, then HQ branch one backups, and corporate headquarter, then branch one, branch two backups. And if we click on, I'm just going to open all three of these in separate windows here by holding down control or command and clicking on the links. So if we show the ones with the backups, they show not only our primary gateway for branch one, but also corporate headquarter and branch two backups. Here's our one for branch two. We've got our branch two, then corporate headquarter, then branch one backup, and our corporate headquarter, branch one and branch two backups. If we look at our corporate headquarter only, we've only got the SIP trunk to corporate headquarters. Branch two only only has the branch two MGCP gateway, and branch one only has the branch one H323 gateway. Okay, so those are our new route groups in their respective route lists. New route lists with backups, with backups, with backups, only, 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 and PSTN SLRG. So this is the one we use for all patterns for the backslash plus bang or exclamation point pattern. These are for emergency services, our only route lists. And then the ones with backups are the ones that we've used in the past for TIHO. Although if we go back out to our route patterns and get rid of looking at this, let's just look at everything, we'll see that we only have our emergency services patterns and then our one standard local route group pattern. We do not have any TIHO patterns at this point. We've got the route lists for the infrastructure and we'll look at how those can affect our device mobility and extension mobility as our last task but for right now, TIHO is not set up. So, prove that point. Take a look at our corporate headquarter router and Jack dials, goes off hook and dials 911. Dial the PSTN phone. The IPC phone over here. And we can see that it only went out corporate headquarters did not go out, uh, it did not go out branch one or branch two gateway. And in fact, if we go ahead and shut down the controller, shut this down. You know what, I probably shouldn't have shut that down because uh, I shut down the WAN link as well. No, I didn't, sorry, this is just the PRI. Yeah, I just. All right, so now controller shut down. Branch two, branch, uh, or sorry, branch one and two, router two and three, respectively, don't have any calls, but do have. Let's do a show debugging here, real quick. We do have ISDN Q931 each turned on. So let's go ahead and make that same 911 call out Jack's phone one.
and we hear that we get the enunciator telling us that the call can't be completed. And that's because the call was extended via uh, SIP out to this gateway, but then this gateway reported that the uh, essentially it was uh, unavailable to make a call. So once this controller comes back up, if we do 911 again, all goes back out this corporate headquarter gateway. Okay, so just to prove that our infrastructure is working properly, draw all that buffer off, and that nothing went out our branch one or branch two gateways, and each gateway should only process its own uh, 911 or 112 also, just to take a look at the infrastructure, uh, we saw our phones back to CCM device page. Uh, we see our corporate headquarter uh, phone one and two. Phone one ends in Alpha 576. Uh, corporate headquarter phone two ends in Foxtrot 1 Delta Echo. We go look at our switch one, show CDP neighbor. We see that we've got the uh, Alpha 576 SEP phone and the Foxtrot 1 Delta Echo, and there's also this 0749, that's our PSTN phone. They all show up on Fast 010 as their local interface to the switch. Okay. Uh, actually, do show VLAN brief. We can see that. Uh, FAST010 is in the phone's VLAN. That's fine. They're in the phone's VLAN. Show run, base FAST0 slash 10. And so do not classroom phones. They're using the access method, well, actually with the access VLAN of 11. Okay. If we look at switch two, show CDP neighbor. We've got two phones here connected to FAST010, uh, Delta 7 Bravo Delta and 1 Alpha 93. And here we've got uh, Delta 7 Bravo Delta and 1 Alpha 93. Our branch two phones. And then also our branch one, router two, where we've got the Ethernet switch module. We've got FAST013 is the local interface with the SEP MAC address that ends in Bravo Alpha Alpha Echo. Here we've got ISO our branch one phone. Okay. We've taken a look at that. Now we need to set up, uh, we've enabled device mobility on the device. Now we need to set up our subnets and we'll set up both the ones that we'll actually be using today and then the ones for the self-study workbook, just to show you how that would be done, and to heads up on a caveat. So back in CUCM, we're going to go over to the system column. We're going to go down to device mobility and what is known as device mobility info, AKA a subnet. And we're going to do a find. We see that there's zero records in the database and we'll add a new one. We're going to call this, uh, let's call it BMI for Device Mobility Info, uh, Corporate Headquarter Phones, and Voice VLAN, and we'll say for Deep Dive Class, and then we'll also do one for your self-study. So our subnet here is 177.1.11.0. Subnet mask number of bits is 24. And we're going to tie this. We forgot to look at the device pools, I believe. New device pools we created. We separated out, again, our corporate headquarter phones and gateways, branch two phones from their gateways, and branch one phones from their gateways. This isn't necessary, but it's just a good idea just to make sure that calling party CSS never accidentally overlaps or gets used the same CSS. Because we opened a new tab, we're actually going to have to go back because the save for this will fail. So let's add a new one. Again, put in 
name we just copied, again, 177.1.11.0 slash 24, and we're going to use the corporate headquarter phones. Save. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy this and uh, call it self-study. And this would be your 192.168. dot And actually, uh, back here, 192.168.10. Dot, I believe we said to use 150. Now here's what I want you to notice. I put in a host IP and I'm about to hit tab and if I were to put in 24 for instance on accident and I tab off of here it's going to say that the subnet, uh, subnet address or mask is invalid for the mask size. Okay? So the subnet address the it's saying that this isn't a valid subnet for a 24-bit mask. It is valid for a 30. So the modified address it tells you is 192.168.10.0. Please click, click OK or cancel to modify it. If you're just fast, you know, like I am sometimes and like a lot of us are when we're just going through, we just answer OK to these uh, dialog boxes that pop up real quick and don't notice what they do. So we go ahead and we're, you know, clicking save and we're modifying our stuff and we don't realize that it changed this to actually .0. So if this is 32, uh, and that would especially happen, let me just delete this and back to our <clears throat> show records. So if we had maybe done a copy where the mask is already 24 bits, and then we go back and do 192.168.10.150, this is where, oh yeah, okay, whatever, save and we realize that this isn't going to work. So, first of all, I didn't rename it. Self-study, and this needs 50. Back, let's change it to 32 as a subnet mask. And now this is valid subnet mask. Let's go back and take a look. We've got our deep dive class, 177.1.11.0 slash 24. And our self-study is 192.168.10.150 slash 30. Where keeping your phones on the same subnet but using static IP addresses rather than DHCP, which DHCP is going to hand you your uh, subnet mask of slash 24. With a static assignment, you can assign it a slash 32, so all 255s. Then you'll be able to uh, provision your phones and get them to uh, on your phones. All you would have to do, by the way, is make sure that the 192.168.10.150 IP address is assigned. You don't have to assign a slash 32 to your phone. In fact, if you do, you will not have a default gateway. So on your physical phone, make sure that you assign a slash 24, 255.255.255.0, and your proper default gateway, probably 192.168.10.1, it's just that CUCM needs to think that it's a slash 32. It doesn't actually have to be a slash 32. Okay, CUCM is going to get the IP address that it registers with. It is not going to get any information from the phone about subnet mask. Okay, so it's just CUCM that thinks it has to be slash 32. Your phone will still be actually configured as a slash 24. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take this. We're going to copy it, and we'll call the... Uh, Branch one, phones, modify the second octet to dot two, and make sure the proper device pool that we're doing association with. And this is where we can have multiple device pools. You know, I could have multiple device pools associated. Maybe uh, I'll have another branch one. Maybe this isn't gateways, but it's branch one phones at building two. I can have multiple device pools, but when I click on the device pool, if the physical location is the same, then that's where no settings will be passed. It's if the physical location is different between these two device pools, that's when the information uh, or that we're, you know, all, all the attributes that we're getting ready to talk about that will be updated, that's when uh, that will function properly is different physical locations. Okay, so we've done this. We're going to, I'm actually going to go back and, uh, eh, which way do I want to do it? I'll just copy this one. So 
So we'll say self study. Thirty-two. I'll change this first, and then one ninety-two is actually going to be one sixty. Grab both of those. I do. Great. And then I'll copy this for branch two phones for the deep dive class. So this second octet dot three. Branch two phones device pool we're going to do association with. Copy it again. Self study. Subnet mask. And then 192.160.10.170 is now we actually weren't told to do this one yet so let's let's hold off shouldn't have probably created that one yet I guess I'm jumping a little bit ahead go ahead and delete that one and just do what we're told for right now all right so we've got our branch one and corporate headquarter uh, VLANs subnets or device mobility infos set up okay so let's go back we accomplished this now we're told to ensure that while Jack's, oops, scrolled just a little bit too far. While Jack's corporate headquarter phone one is visiting the branch one site, that all of the following work properly. Okay, we've already read this, so I'm not going to read it all over again. Let's just go and actually accomplish this. And I want you to take note. I'm breaking everything down real slowly and granularly, so that hopefully you understand exactly what it is we're doing to configure and uh, you know why and uh, what it takes to set up device mobility, how everything functions, how it interacts with each other and interoperates. But I want to take a step back real briefly and just look at what have we actually done so far? Other than looking at a lot of stuff and testing some preliminary stuff like where 911 routed out, which gateway, and how we had set up, uh, hadn't set up TIHO, but had set up our 911 and our partition. Other than doing that, what have we actually changed? One phone, one and only phone, corporate headquarter phone one, that is going to be roaming physically, we enabled device mobility. Then we created a device mobility info, different VLANs, VLAN for branch one and VLAN for corporate headquarters. And we created a couple for each site, but that's just because of nuance difference between the way it will be in the real lab, which is what the way I'm trying to describe to you and, and demo to you how you would do it in the real lab, and uh, your self-study time. So we've created two subnets. We're about to create two device mobility groups to represent, actually, sorry, right now we're just going to create one for the one country, and we're going to modify a couple things on a device pool, and that's it. Past that, all we do is go actually you know, move the phone and do the testing. So everything else is really just a bunch of verbose reading of our task that looks really long and difficult. In fact, if I back this out to a single page, it's an entire page for one task. However, what was it? We clicked on his corporate headquarter phone one and said enable device mobility and restart the phone. Created two subnets. We're going to create one country or device mobility group, and we're going to modify two small settings, maybe a few more, on a device pool. That's it. If you get, and the reason I'm pointing this out is, if you get asked something regarding device mobility, or even they don't tell you device mobility in the real lab, they only ask you to accomplish the functionality of what amounts to everything we're doing here, and device mobility fits the bill uh, very nicely and would work, as a solution to the question or task they're asking you to do. Keep in mind that I, you know, the verbosity of wording can be overwhelming for one task. But what if this task were only worth three points? You might say, wow, an entire page of wording just for three points, or maybe even two points? Well, keep in mind that the amount of points sometimes has uh, maybe direct correlation or an indication, better yet, of the difficulty of the actual configuration or even conceptual uh, thought process that's going to take to go into it, interactions with other things. 
And I guess all I'm trying to say is device mobility is such an easy task that you probably couldn't be asked to do anything easier. I mean, there's just not a lot to the actual configuration. Understanding how it works is important and, you know, can initially maybe be a little bit of a brain bender. But once you've set it up a couple times, you'll realize how easy it is to set up and then also really how easy the concepts are. Um, if this were worth more points, like four or five for one task, well then just, uh, you know, get very excited because they're very easy points to actually go and accomplish, even if it looks like there's a lot of information here that seems to be a bit overwhelming. Okay, so we're gonna now go create our necessary device mobility group. To a find, we have none. And we're gonna create one called a DMG, device mobility group, and we'll call it uh, Uh, let's just call it US. Device Mobility Group uh, US. It. All we need is one device mobility group for what we're about to do. We also need uh, physical location. So I did omit creating physical locations. One more small step. We'll create a physical location. Again, it's just a name. So physical, uh, sorry, PL for physical location. And we'll call it corporate headquarters. Call it corporate headquarters. Yeah, let's just call it PL corporate headquarters. That's good. And we're going to add a new one called PL branch one. That was really difficult. Now we're going to go create, or not create, but modify our device pools. So we created two subnets, DMIs, device mobility info created one device mobility group representing the country, and created two physical locations, one for each of our physical locations. In the device mobility info, or the subnet, we already tied the subnet to the one or possible multiple device pools. We only tied it to one, each. Here, we'll go into each of those device pools, corporate headquarter phones, and we've already got a lot of these settings set, right? We've already got date, time, group, and region, and media resource group list and location from previous modules. Now what we're going to do is add physical location and device mobility group. Okay, so we'll say physical location is corporate headquarters, and device mobility group, well, we're in the U.S. Now, these were something that were configured on the phone prior to this module. I've already set them up ahead of time as part of the startup configs, but all I did was move them from the device out to the device pool. And actually, if we were to take a look at the, the phone device, I'm not gonna open it because I don't want this device pool not to save properly. Uh, but if we were to open it, I actually haven't taken them off. I didn't take the calling search space off of the corporate headquarter phone one device or the AAR calling search space or group or calling party transformation CSS. In fact, let's just go ahead and at the risk of the fact that it won't save properly. Let's just go ahead and open up the corporate headquarter phone one device and take a look at it. I think it's important. CSS is still the CSS for dial device corporate headquarter PSTN. AAR CSS is still set. AAR group is still set. Media resource group list. Uh, whoops, actually that's up here. Uh, but that is that was already relying on the device pool. Calling party transformation is set. Now the hub none location is kind of a bad example since I'm, I'm moving corporate headquarter phone uh, because if I were moving another phone that maybe had something specific set, uh, then what is specifically set on the device obviously overrides whatever's set on the device pool. But if we remember back to, what module was it? Uh, I believe we talked about it in, I can't remember exactly which module, we talked about uh, call admission control and locations. I believe it was module two. But if we remember back, locations, uh, specifically the hub underscore none location, 
is a special uh, call admission control location in CUCM that we cannot modify, and it's called hub underscore none because it means two possible things. Notice that there's a lot of other entities that we have, MRGL and uh, common device configuration. There, there's plenty of other things that if left to, you know, less than, none, greater than, so the none inside those less than, greater thans, or alligators as I call them, then uh, we leave it to none, it means go back to the last entity or the lesser priority entity and check what the setting is there. So device pool, go check what the, the setting in the device pool is typically. If we had none on the line, it checks the uh, device and then it checks the device pool and then possibly the service parameters in the case of things like user and network audio source file. Okay, location is no different. If it's set to hub none, then this means none, if it's on the device, go back and check the device pool and then do whatever's on the device pool. And then if we, on the device pool, have it set to hub none, well, then it actually takes the hub format. Okay, but if this were set to hub none on a branch one phone, we would go back to the device pool where it would probably and hopefully be set to location branch one. Okay, so sort of a special entity there. Uh, and we do happen to have calling party device pool CSS checked for the checkbox. This is primarily because of imports and the way they work but we could have something more specifically set, such as, in fact, let's just go ahead and do this, uh, for CNG, PTP, so calling party, corporate headquarter, phones. Let's just go ahead and save this. Successful, it's set, use device pool is not set. Let's reset and restart this phone. Start here. Okay, that's restarting. And now we're going to go ahead and go back to our device pool where we're going to just note that we have these settings and they're the same because we're looking at the same device pool that the device was already set to. This is its home device. Save. This is probably going to fail. It does. Hit save again. Update successful. And phone is already actually resetting a second time because we just updated the device pool. Happened to catch the phone right when it was trying to register. Just in case. Both phones and the gateway. Well, no, actually not the gateway. We broke the gateway out into its own separate device pool. I already said that. Okay, so those phones will restart and in the meantime, we're going to come back here. Let's just dive back into this and just make sure, yep, uh, physical location and DMG are still set. Let's go to the branch one phone's device pool and set physical location to branch one and device mobility group to the US. So when the phone registers, when we unplug corporate headquarter phone one from its headquarter subnet and plug it into the branch one subnet and we'll verify the IP address here and CDP on the router, Ethernet switch module in the branch one router. We'll note it's going to come up on a separate subnet or separate DMI. That DMI points it to a separate device pool. Remember the second device mobility info or subnet was tied to the branch one device pool. So then the branch one device pool will be checked to see is the physical location different. And because the physical location of PL branch one is different than the home gateway, PL corporate headquarters, that's when we know that we at least have to uh, update these settings, local route group and all the roaming sensitive settings on the device. And before we update any settings, we ask the question, is the DMG, the country, is that the same or different? If it's different, we only update these settings. If it's the same, and in the corporate headquarter branch one sense, we only have one DMG so far, so it will be, then we update all of these settings. And again, the reason we update these settings, if we're in the same country, because the calling search space still points to partitions that still contain PSTN patterns that are in the same format of our dialing habits. However, 
the CSS points out a different gateway. Okay? And the calling party transformation <clears throat> should, if all of our offices are set up similarly, should reflect the local office that we're now at, but still in the same format for the same country that we're used to residing in or living in. Okay? If we're between DMGs, so it's a different DMG or a different country, then we don't want to get the new CSS because we don't want to get the new calling, uh, not habits, but you know we don't want to have to dial in a new way. We might not know how to. So we will only, physical location is different, but DMG is different as well, then we'll only update these set. Okay, so let's click Save. And again, that's all we've had to do is enable device mobility on the device, create two DMIs, one DMG, two physical locations, and then just quickly modify two device pools to add physical location and DMG. Okay, and these are things that in a large scale design you would have already had uh, populated because you would be using your device pool, at least hopefully, in a proper large scale design, you'd be using your device pool to set all of these settings for your phone devices. Okay, so our phones should be back up and registered. They are all registered. Actually, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get to that one in a moment. Okay, so our corporate headquarter phone one is still on the 177.1.11 <laughs> subnet. Device here, search control, didn't come back after start. The phone did, but the con remote control didn't. Two, like this 1002, sometimes they don't. Normally they don't. All right. Now, <clears throat> all I'm going to do is actually physically unplug my phone from the corporate headquarters site. <clears throat> I think maybe I'll uh, show you doing this. So uh, let me actually just mention while I'm doing this, that if you were asked to do anything mic back at me if you were asked to do anything uh, in, in any sort of task related to device mobility again because we are set up here in the exact same fashion as you'll see it in the lab, where you have phones in front of you, but your hardware isn't, your physical racks, but your hardware phones are in front of you, and you, uh, they look like they're on those remote physical layer two subnets and, and links and LANs. They would most likely have an extra cable hanging out, or else have you disconnect one of your phones, probably an extra cable for each of the other two sites that they wanted you to roam to. But because you would actually have to physically unplug a phone, uh, not that you're not allowed to do that in the lab, but because you would have to and because the proctor wouldn't necessarily know without having to check every night to make sure you had plugged your primary phone back in the proper location, hadn't moved around other phones to different cables, you know, that's a little bit administratively burdensome for them, uh, maybe a lot, especially if you get a candidate that doesn't know what they're doing at all and they move a lot of phones around to different uh, links. And a phone is supposed to be, you know, corporate headquarter phone one is supposed to be on a specific fast zero or fast one slash zero slash 12 or whatever interface they tell you in your table or topology. Because of that, I think it's less likely of a task that they'll ask you to do, which is unfortunate because, as we've just demonstrated, it's a very easy uh, configuration. But anyhow, let's get back to the moving. So, bear with me. Registering. Up, but then it immediately resets. For this is that it powers IP subnet and phone, and now that there's a new 
was, and then the device pool to the position. Device is in roaming location. Okay, said that for a while. It's back to your current options. But it said device was in a roaming location. Just put my mic back on here. So now we definitely need to go back and set this device back up again or tell it to control. Okay, so we're pulling up the corporate headquarter phone, one. And let's go take a look at the phones page. Let's do a find. And corporate headquarter phone one now shows up as 177.2.11.54. And branch one, phone one, is unregistered because we unplugged it. It's going to remain that way. <clears throat> and the only unfortunate thing there is we cannot test a call between corporate headquarter phone one and branch one phone one to see a G711 codec. But don't worry, we will do that when we remove branch two phone one and make a call between corporate headquarter phone one and branch two phone two when corporate headquarter phone one is roaming to the branch two site. Okay, so also let's go out and take a look at our open switch one and do show CDP neighbor. We only see two phones at the, the corporate headquarters switch F010. And on router two, we did have one phone off F013, but it was Bravo Alpha Alpha Echo. Now it is one phone, but it's Alpha 576. Alpha 576 is, as we can see, corporate headquarter phone one. Okay, also show IP DHCP findings we see that, uh, what was it, Alpha 576? That Alpha 576 now has an IP address 177.2.11.54, which is exactly what we see it as here. Page, look at the phone, etc. Okay, so we're now roaming to another subnet. So let's take a look at. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at our requirements and what we were told. Class of restriction and calls should still show up as coming from 1001 and Jack Shepard, respectively. Uh, ensure that his phone reflects proper date and time. Let's do those first. Let's look at his phone. And the corporate headquarter phone one, uh, sorry, phone two, is at 959. It was in Pacific time, or GMT minus eight. And this should be in central time, which is two hours off, GMT minus uh, six. So it's 11.59 a.m. and 9.59 a.m. So the date time, the date's still the same, but the time has updated properly. Let's see about a call from Jack to maybe, let's say, uh, Hurley. Let's look at the codec. Let's call uh, 1002. Okay, that's ringing. That call. And we'll take a look at the codex. And we see that the region updated properly because we're now on a G729 call between us. Take a look at the stream like. So our remote IP, uh, our local IP is 177.2.11.54. Our remote is 177.1.11.31. And then the opposite on this phone because they're talking to each other. Okay, we'll close our stats. Go ahead and end that call. Now we'll look at a call out to the PSTN, so let's clear off all of our clear off all of our buffers and scroll back. And first of all, let's make a call from 1002, which is the phone that is not roaming, to 91.
So the phone that is not roaming, Hugo or Hurley, that calls out, so the 1002 phone calls out the corporate headquarter gateway. But clear this buffer off so we can distinguish. If I call from Jack's phone, which is roaming, call goes out my branch one gateway. Okay? And if I were to shut my branch one gateway down, let's go ahead and end this call. Controller T1000 shut. And I try to do this call again, just hit redial. Okay, so we can't dial out branch one gateway, so we can't dial out anywhere. Clear off this again when it's up. And we hit redial. It works from Jack Shepard. It displays his number as it should locally as a 10 digit number. Calls out to 911. Okay? What about calls to other numbers? What about calls to, uh, let's say, let's make a call to 9. Remember, his dialing habits shouldn't have to change. 206, uh, 501. Five one one one. Now, normally, this would have to be a long-distance call. We'd have to dial nine one, and it changes our call to nine one and sends it out as a national or long-distance call. And again, this is because we're inheriting our standard local route group. So, actually, the standard local route group is what came into play here. The standard local route group was inherited. And uh, it has to be, you know, if we take a look at our configuration, we've got translation patterns and those that start with nine specifically, we've got our local pattern, which had to have been matched because it's what we dialed, nine and then 10 digits. We didn't dial a one. So it matched this pattern and it prefixed a plus one after discarding pre dot, so dropping the nine and plus one and send it on to the CSS for translation pattern to route pattern standard local route group. Okay, if we look at that CSS, translation pattern, here's our CSS TP to RP. We've only got the partition translation pattern to route pattern. Go take a look at our route patterns, or actually let's do one better, let's take a look at route plan report for any uh, pattern, well, any pattern that begins with backslash plus anywhere, and we've got a number of them, but we've only got, if I do a find here, translation pattern to route pattern, we've only got one and keep clicking next or previous, we've only got one, and it is a route pattern. So if I click on this route pattern, we actually could have already seen just from that last uh, screen here that it, the route detail goes out to the route list PSTN SLRG and then rings the standard local route group. So then it goes back to the calling number, which is a corporate headquarter phone one, but it rang out a router two or branch one phone. Uh, sorry, branch one gateway, even though it's a corporate headquarter phone. Again, this is because in CUCM, back to the device pool, it used to be using this home device pool, but it's inherited everything, including local route group or the branch one device pool. Okay? So calling search space it inherited, that's why we're now going out our new gateway. What about inbound calling party transformation or localization? Well, let's take a look at that. Clear off our scroll back buffer. The call is going to come in corporate headquarters because we're dialing from the PSTN here. 
and we dial from the PSTN, let's say we're going to dial from uh, uh, 1512, so line 2, which would normally be a branch 1 line, it is a branch 1 line, and it would normally show up to corporate headquarter phones as 1512. In fact, let's dial from here into 206-501-1002, Hugo's phone that is not roaming, comes in our corporate headquarter gateway, and if his phone uh, refreshes, which it doesn't look like it wants to, refresh, There we go. It showed 1512. Okay? But if I call in using the same line to 206 501 1001, it's going to show on Jack's phone. Uh, it actually still shows as 1512. Okay? Well, let's go take a look at our calling. Uh, calling party transformation CSS and now we actually have that configured take a look over here calling party CSS and actually let's only look at the partition that contains branch One, we've got gateway and phones, and it should drop off that pre dot. Doesn't look like it did. And the reason is, if we go back and take a look at the phone, corporate headquarter phone one, is that while it overrode all the rest of the settings, this is where we actually do have to be using the device pool for calling party transformation CSS. So it overrides all of the settings except for this one if we leave it set more specifically. And there's actually a good reason for this. Uh, it's possible that I could be visiting another site, want to inherit the new calling search space, and AAR CSS and AAR group, uh, but I want to maintain the way that I see calls show up. So I want to use the new gateways, but I want to maintain the way I see calls show up. So I'm going to restart this uh, corporate headquarter phone one. Still going to show up as roaming mode. But now I'm going to inherit the branch one CSS for uh, calling party transformation. Okay, device and roaming location we see. So now let's do the call in. Two. And while that's showing, notice branch two, branch one. Okay, the call didn't come in branch one. It couldn't have. The carrier's still going to send it. So now we'll answer the call on this phone, which still hasn't updated yet, but hopefully we'll... There we go. Now it shows up the proper calling party CSS because we told it to use the device pool. Okay, so it used its home device pool when it's at home, and it uses its roaming device pool when it's roaming. Okay. We've already ensured they use the G729 codec back to corporate headquarter phone 2. Let's ensure that multicast music on hold streams properly to this phone. So let's go ahead and call between Jack and Hurley. Go off hook, press mute, and we're going to bring up our branch 1 to a show IP M route. Okay, we don't see any big multicast uh, 
traffic coming in. Let's make sure multicast is still set up properly. Uh, didn't get messed up from any of the previous imports of startup configs. Both of these. Cast is enabled. Ah, there's no music on hold audio sources. Let's take a look at this quick because sometimes when we do our imports, it doesn't overwrite this flag properly. Allow multicasting, save. Now we'll go back to our server and do a refresh. Now we've got our sample audio source. We're going to need at least three hops for this to work. Publisher as well. P239111 is the base IP for the publisher. 239121 is the base for the subscriber. Let's make sure our IP Voice Media Streaming App Service is set up properly for G729. It's not, so let's allow that as well. It tells us that the audio quality is going to be terrible, and we say OK. The 720 optimized for the range of hertz that music takes. And let's make sure our MRGs are set for multicast enable. We have our M MOH, our multicast with the true flag on. Yells. One. They have the, currently they have the unicast. Grab the multicast, and let's make sure the sub is first. Here, go ahead and check out corporate headquarter. Not that we're going to be streaming. Multicast pub first. Now let's set the sub first there. Now you know what? Let's set the pub first there. So if we were streaming from corporate headquarters, it would come from the pub. From branch one, it would come from the sub server, and branch two, let's also set that to the pub first. Multicast, it already is. Great. So now we're set up for our multicast. Now we see 239.113, that's the pub. Uh, dot three is the third codec. G711 mu laws dot one. G711 a laws dot two. G729 is dot three, and if you ever forget that, Go back to your CUCM audio source file, click on it, and here in your output file list is MULA, ALA, 729, and Wideband. 1, 2, dot 3, and dot 4. A dot 5 would be source file number 2, MULA, and so on. That's the increment on IP address. Okay, so here's our 239.113 coming from the publisher. And 239.123 should be here somewhere. There we go. 239.1.2.3 is coming from the subscriber. However, currently the outgoing interface list, or OIL, is null. Right? All right. Let's just make sure multicast is set up. Uh, show run pipe to section for multicast. Got IP multicast routing. Let's do show run uh, pipe to include CCM manager or music on hold out to the PSTN. That's there. And then show run interface VLAN 11, which is our voice VLAN. And we have PIM dense mode. Okay. So let's now have early put Jack on hold. Hopefully you can hear that music. Take a look at our show IPM route again. Actually, let's take a look at show IPM route pipe to include 239.1.2.3. I actually should have done uh, begin with that so that we could see 239.1.2.3 is going out VLAN 11 dense mode coming in the serial interface. So 
So it is streaming across the WAN out to the phone VLAN, and here I have it on my the audio actually on my phone. If I were to take a look at my phone control, stats, stream, refresh, here I see that I'm coming 239.123 and that it's G729. Okay, G729. Go ahead and hang up that call. Okay, so that works properly. Ensure that if he attempts to set up a conference that local branch one hardware resources are utilized. So let's make sure we've got a conference bridge registered to branch one, iOS, and we don't right now. Thought we had actually had one set up. I'll just set it up here real quick. I'm fairly certain it is. iOS router, but let's just take a look. Go run pipe to section skinny. SP farm. Okay. We don't have a conference bridge set up on this one, so I'll take that out of the task. Uh, I think we might have one on the next or we could just set one up real quick really wouldn't hurt let's just go ahead and do that real quick copy this call it device pool is branch one let's just say gateways uh, location branch one save ESP Farm Profile 4 Conference. Uh, let's do all of the codecs here. Four. Uh, sorry, not four. Actually, we don't have enough sessions. That's one of the problems. That's why I didn't have it in here. All right, well, let's just do this then. Transcode, shut it down. Yes, we want to. Take it off universal. So let's say on, but this time without universal. So it uses half as many uh, resources. And you'll remember that from five, I believe it was. Also say max sessions two. Top of that and associate. Now let's go back to Farm Profile 4 for our conference bridge. And let's do show run pipe to section skip. Nope. So we should be in this DSP farm. Up, oh, you know what? I forgot to turn this up. But or say to associate application and no shut back to our SCCP group. Associate profile four and have it register as, and then we'll finally say SCCP to turn everything back on. We'll write our configuration, export that as part of the final, do a show SCCP, 
active, 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 and active. So this should be, when we go back to find it, registered. Branch One Hardware Conference is registered. That's good. Now we're going to go to our uh, media resource group for Branch One Hardware, and we will add this Branch One Hardware Conference, save, and we'll go to our MRGL for Branch One. Make sure that it has the Branch One MRG higher for hardware, higher than the corporate headquarter. We're good, so now we need to actually reset any devices at Branch One, which our Branch One Phone One is not registered, but our corporate headquarter Phone One is, and to know that, it will reset. Let's actually tell our device pool for Branch One to reset and restart its entities, and let's go watch this phone reset, because it's using the Branch One device pool settings. Okay, device and roaming location. Now we'll set up a call, let's say out to the PSTN. We'll just call 911. Answer that here. Go ahead and go mute. Get up with me. Oh, and what we'll do now is we'll set up a conference. So I'll have Jack conference in. Hugo or Hurley, 1002. He'll answer we'll hit conference. What we want to see is that we're actually using the branch one conference resources. We could use RTMT, real time monitoring tool to see this. Or we could also do show the uh, connections. See that we've got a 1G729 call over to corporate headquarters. And then we've also got our own 177.211. And then 177.1.254.2, that's our own local loopback. If I do a show IP interface brief pipe to in loopback, that's our own local IP address because we're calling out to the PSTN G711. So two, two G711 and a G729 using the Branch One conference resources. Call, and we'll look at our next task. Okay, all calls you should attempt to make are to go up Branch One primarily, calls to 911. We've already done this. We've already looked at Jack's styling habits are not changing. Sure that if the branch one site were to lose WAN connectivity, that his phone would fall back. Let's do this after we actually do the others, just because the falling back won't take long, but the re-associating to CUCM, a little bit of time, and we'll allow that to happen over the break for the next task. So let's look at call admission control. If there's not enough bandwidth, AAR should work properly. So we already looked at the calling party transformation CSS. So let's look at AAR. Let's go to our system location and change the branch one location from 400 down to 23. So if four is a G729 call, then 20 will allow one call. And we'll now try AAR. So he'll try to call 1002. The network congestion rerouting, and the call has gone out to 91206. What gateway did it go out? Left out the branch one gateway, bringing in from 206 501 1001 into 1002. AR did work properly, and I'm within a device mobility group or within the same country. Been clear buffers here. 
Okay, so the last thing we have to test is the SRST. So just like in the real lab, on our branch one site where our phone is registered, show IP interface brief, here is our link back. Just uh, config T, go into that interface, shut it down. I was telneted in, so I'm going to have to now go in through my backdoor console port. Show IP interface brief will show that that interface is administratively down. So that also means that show IP route has no routes, only locally connected interfaces, no OSPF. Phone still looks like it's up, but it should be resetting here. Here we go. Now it's resetting. Now controlling it remotely uh, probably isn't going to work because the control of this goes back through the WAN. Uh, yeah, the control of this goes back through the WAN, so there's probably no way that I'm going to be able to control it, but what I can do is show you the phone. Going out from 1001. Reached either store. frame here. So our SRST mode looks like it's working properly. If I do show ePhones. I've got one ePhone unregistered and one ePhone Alpha, Fi Alpha 576 registered with number 1001. Corporate headquarter phone falling back to a branch one gateway because of device mobility. Okay, so we've met all the tasks.